Welcome to More Fanime. I'm your fan of More Anime. How's everybody doing? Uh, today, I'm going to be taking a deep dive into the Reverie arc, if you can call it an arc, of the One Piece. This is a fantastic fantastic arc. Um, is it its own separate arc or is it like part of Whole Cake Island? Because it's very short. I don't even know. You kind of call it a moment in this story, this massive story. And this moment, the reverie, was pff, fucking insane. I think it was chapter 902 to 908. Um, it was six chapters, something something like that. Nuts how much information Oda fit fit into this into this box. Um and it, I really feel like the Reverie arc is going to be so important uh, throughout the rest of the series and I think very important to the end of the series. I feel like Oda put this is this is crazy how much they st- put into this. And I'm still trying to unpack this. I finished reading it yesterday. I did not feel confident doing this review yesterday. I had to really sleep on it because there's a lot of new things that were introduced and a lot of new facts about characters we didn't even know. Uh, But before I get started into spoiler territory, if you haven't read The Reverie Arc, I highly uh, suggest you read or watch it before you listen to this review because it is mind-blowing. It blew my mind and I am so excited to discuss this with you. But before that, please like and subscribe to the More Fanime page. It helps me out oh so much. We just recently hit the 500 subscriber mark and hopefully by the time this video goes out we'll be much higher than that. The goal for the end of the year is 1,000 subscribers. Hopefully I will hit to that goal. If not, life goes on. Um, And and don't forget to get yourself a more Fanime t-shirt. Link is down below. Become a more Fanimaniac like all my great subscribers. Uh, This Reverie arc was very entertaining and honestly could be animated into like a movie because but it, there's no real conclusion it'd be the only problem but it was so much fun and I couldn't turn the page fast enough there was a part in it that just made me so tense and so worried about a certain character I was just losing my mind I couldn't turn the pages I was like come on come on are they going to be okay are they going to be okay that's how intense this moment was and that was the midway point it all kicks off with the uh, repercussions of the Big Mom uh, issue at Whole Cake Island. And I think Luffy and the gang are on their way uh, to Wano, I believe. I think I think they're on their way to Wano right now. And uh, I believe that's where the rest of the crew is. I, I, I'm not If you could comment down below how much time passed between when they went from Zoe throughout the Big Mom arc. Like how much... Sp- time have they been separated this time around it's going to be nice to see the rest of the crew we had a separate arc with team a with zoro and robin and frankie and then we had an arc with team b with nami chopper brooke and the straggler carrot uh and is there anybody else with us? Jim Bay left. He's fighting Big Mom's forces. Hopefully he's okay. And so Sanji starts off this this part, this arc, with his... He's got a... Uh, the Germa 6, or 66, gave him a, a canister, an outfit, one of their crazy Power Ranger suits. But he refuses to use it, but Luffy wants it. It's really cool. I'm not sure if he will use it, but I don't know why Oda would put this in um, the manga for him not to to use it. But he says if he's going to get stronger, he doesn't need the power of science to make that happen. And he's living proof that, you know, he can handle himself even against his brothers in their germ outfits. So I can't imagine this outfit helping um, Sanji that much. I'm not even 100% sure what the outfits do exactly. I know they're kind of like an armor, and I think they can make you fly? But um, 
do they all have different abilities in these outfits or are they just built in abilities like the poison power or that whatever the hell the other brothers did um but hopefully he you know maybe uses it but i i, I don't know I, I like sanji the way he is and he, he's an amazing character who just had an amazing arc. Then we get a long portion of time dedicated to Luffy's new bounty. The whole crew's new bounty, actually. Uh, I think Sanji's bounty is higher than Zoro's now. Hmm? Which is pretty cray-cray. But maybe Zoro's will go up even higher than that. But I, I think it'll be fun to see Sanji tell Zoro that his bounty is currently higher. It'd be really funny if he does that and then right after finds out that Zoro's has gone up even higher than his. And he's like, why? He's never had any luck with these bounties. But I think the Vin Smoke in his name helped his, uh, his rep. You know, he was kind of an unknown before that. Uh, uh, he came out of nowhere. The government just didn't, they underestimated him. He even mentioned that at Thriller Bark. Now they know he is a threat. And he could be a bigger threat than Zoro at this point. He could be a bigger threat than Luffy if he wants to. Probably not. But he's a big threat. And he's one of the big three of the Straw Hat crew. And um, the fact that his bounty's so damn high, second in the crew, I think, unless Jim Bay's is higher. I don't believe it is. I think they did show his too. Those are just the, the most important ones. We get to see a whole shit ton of characters we haven't seen in a while, including Vivi. We, we did see them getting ready for the Reverie, but we really got to spend some time with Vivi and the Alabasta Kingdom, which she's from, and the Fishman Island crew all showed up. All the princesses made an appearance from the past. I'm trying to rem I feel like I'm, there's the, the Fishman Island crew. Oh, Rebecca shows up. That's, that's a little thing I have a problem with. Last time we saw Rebecca, she left the kingdom to be uh, the daughter of her father, Kairos, and they were going to like run off together or at least live together. And I thought she abandoned her, her like uh, princessness. But in this arc, they made it pretty clear that she's still part of the royal family. And they actually gave her more screen time than Viola, who I think should have been in this spot. They didn't need to bring... Rebecca's story was, you know, over, in my opinion. With her father, they could live in happy joy, joy. That's what they should be doing. Viola, who decided to stay in the royal family, should be the big cheese from that, from Dressarosa, in my opinion. I like Rebecca, but I feel like her ending was perfect for her life going forward. She gave it all up to spend time with her dad, who spent all those years helping her out when he was a toy some Jerry Springer stuff, you know? Uh, but it was cool to see all the princesses meet up together. Even before that, though, the Fishman Island crew show up, and they're like, uh, they have security to keep them safe, I'm assuming, or unless every royal family had a Navy soldier like Garp with them. Vice Admiral Garp is uh, finally seen again. I don't think we've seen him yet in the New World, and he is guiding the royal, uh, you know, fishman peoples, the King Neptune and uh, Shirahoshi and her brothers, to the Reverie, to Moria. Is it Moria? Or Mary Jo? Mor Mary, I can't ever say that damn name. That really holy place where the celestial dragons live. And we get to see that son of a bitch, Carlos, again, that celestial dragon that Luffy punched into next week, that guy shows up and he has decided to challenge, um, not challenge, what am I thinking? Challenge my patience, I guess. But he, he has decided to capture Shirahoshi and make him his pet. Well, at least have his servants capture her and take full, uh, you know, credit for it. He is the representation. Whenever I think of a celestial dragon, I think of this guy. And I was very worried the minute he was looking uh, fondly at Shirahoshi, who was just showing up. Um, and it was like, wow, you think they'd be under protection, even from the Celestial Dragons, to show up to this world meeting? No. Like, why would they, why would the Fishmen ever want to go to this meeting when they could easily be taken in as a slave? Even if they are royalty, they have no protection, which is redonk. 
Like, I can't imagine, they, why would they ever in a million years bring Shirahoshi up there and not expect something like this to happen? Um, so they get guided in by Garp. Great seeing Garp again. Uh, all these people that are there, including Wapple and the people from uh, Chopper's Kingdom. God, what is it called? Drum Island, but I think it's called the Cherry Blossom Kingdom now. Wapple's Kingdom is called the Evil Drum Island or some shit. I love that it's evil is in the name. It's just ridiculous that they let's get, let this guy gain power and also be part of this royal meeting when they know he's an, uh, kind of a laughing stock. But I guess he was able to build his way back up. It's kind of a success story in a way. He could write a book. He should write a book. Uh, the damn, uh, everybody's gawking at Luffy's new bounty, which is, I believe, the highest bounty that we've seen. Because uh, Jack's was, uh, Jack from Kaido's crew was like a billion. But Luffy's now is 1.5 billion. And everybody's, you know, fanboying over this and super happy for Luffy. Really cool. Then we get to see Shanks uh, react to it and that's exciting because Shanks is rarely seen in this story and you know if you see him uh, big shit is happening and this dude Shanks shows up to the reverie but secretly it seems not to be part of this kingdom thing but to secretly meet with the five elders these uh, super celestial dragons is what I like to call them they you know they run the show and they treat Shanks like like an equal. Like, hey, we wouldn't usually have a meeting, but since it was you, we decided to do that. Like, what does this mean? This is the very first time in this entire series that I thought that maybe Shanks has some alternative motive helping Luffy out. I, I thought he was the goodest of good guys. And now that he's meeting with these five jackasses who I assume are just terrible people, um what's going on there but he does tell them i need to talk he basically says one thing i need to talk to you guys about a certain pirate and i can't imagine that he went all the way over there to tell them about uh anybody else but luffy or blackbeard um that's that's all i could think of really those are the two big names these older guys should already know about Kaido. They should already know about Big Mom. There are no, no reasons for Shanks to worry about them right at this moment. But Luffy is getting pretty strong now. And Blackbeard has built an, app, an empire, apparently, as, since he's an emperor. So, what's going on? Unless maybe Aokiji, who's now a pirate? Uh, maybe? I, I can't imagine that. He works for Blackbeard. It's got to be Luffy or Blackbeard. And I feel like Blackbeard would be the assumption if you assume that he, if you assume that Shanks is 100% a good gay. But the way he was like cloaked and hidden and his crew wasn't no, was nowhere to be, be seen. Um, I'm wondering if he's doing this uh, without his crew's knowledge of it or if his crew is involved in this. What, unless the elders are just like, hey, we listen to what you have to say because you're a good emperor you're a good pirate and you kind of keep things in order down there you know what i just realized something what if shanks is an elder or, or, or a member of the celestial dragons what if he's somehow connected there and he is sent down to the pirate he was sent down to the pirate realm at a young age um to become a pirate and to keep them in line Am I, am I getting somewhere? And maybe become an emperor to keep them in line. I don't know. That's weird. Uh, we also get to see uh, our boy Sabo again and revolutionaries. A whole shit ton of revolutionaries show up. Um, there's one of them. There's a chick live revolutionary. She seemed like she was like the leader of the crew. She had this tie on and this jet shirt. I... Uh, one of my favorite female designs in the entire series, for sure. Uh, lots of really cool characters that I wish we had had time to meet earlier, because it almost looks like the revolutionaries are about to go into their ultimate mission, because they have a meeting with, uh, with at, at New Kama, or Kama, whatever it's called, with 
Ivy, Eva, Eva, I think her name is, uh, the Queen of Queens, and they have a discussion about their big plan, and none of them are dead, luckily, thanks, because Blackbeard, you know, attacked their original uh, place with headquarters, and now they're planning to attack the Celestial Dragons. Sabo even says something to the effect that the world government isn't their problem, it's the Celestial Dragons, or it's the Marines aren't their problem. Uh, they don't mind the world government. They mind the Celestial Dragons. So their war is with the Celestial Dragons, who have all this power. Which makes a lot of sense, because, I mean, the Marines do good things. It's just corruption within that system that needs to be fixed. But the Celestial Dragons are just pieces of crap. And who knows how many of them there are at this point, because there's probably generations of them. And they're like, or they have a whole, like, mini island for themselves with advanced technology. Oh, my God. One of the most gruesome scenes I've ever seen. I thought that seeing that guy carry Carlos on his back was devastatingly uh, tough for me to watch in the manga. Then in the anime, it was even way uh, sadder, I guess. Way more emotionally impactful seeing it animated. Now I see a fleet of slaves pulling this like escalator thing, this moving floor for the, kind of like you see in an airport, if you just get on this this moving floor thing, it's kind of like an escalator, I don't know what they're called. Uh, you get on it and these slaves underneath that you cannot see are pulling it and they're being told not to go too fast, not to, um, uh, I don't know, not to stutter, not to slow down. They, they can't get anything right, it's if they just right, don't want to pull too hard. And one of the slaves even says, like, well, somebody save me or at least kill me. That's dark. That's some dark writing, Oda, and I'm here for it. I love that. Um, I did not expect to see a scene like that in One Piece. I'll tell you that. But I, it's very reminiscent of the guy walking on his hands. Rough, rough shit. It just makes me wonder what other technology that they have in this uh, Moria Mori Joe, Mori Joe, uh, in their in their world, in this celestial dragon world that are controlled by humans or children. I'm not sure if you guys have seen, um, God, I can't remember its name, but there's a movie about a train that goes around the earth because the world has frozen because of an ice age. I can't remember the name of the movie, but Chris Evans is in it and they have this train that had a part that broke. And so the only way to fix it was to have a child sit in there and do the thing, the part that broke that did just put this thing in there keep doing this thing underneath there but it's pretty rough and only a kid can fit in this hole which is messed up in a lot of ways and i could imagine that later on oda's going to top himself and we're going to see children slaves uh, operating machinery for these uh, celestial dragons and it's going to be pretty brutal that was uh, a rough scene. One of my favorite scenes in this was seeing Luchi uh, from CP9 show up with Kaku, my boy, with the long square nose, uh, Giraffe Man. They all show up with CP0 along with that Stussy guy, lady, Stussy. Uh, that we met at at uh, Whole Cake Island, so she was a secret agent, which is cray cray, and they show up and actually stop um, King Neptune from attacking Carlos, who was attempting to uh, steal his daughter Shirahoshi and claim her as his pet, and I was. Re losing my mind. I didn't know what to do. Not only did they have to deal with the Celestial Dragons, but then Lucci and his gang of bastards show up. I'm really into Lucci now. I, w I don't think I was so hot on him the first time we met him for some reason, but now his look, the white suit, um, his attitude right now, the confidence he's putting off, uh, how much time we've spent with his character back then. I'm real excited to see Rob Lucci do more stuff and see how strong he's gotten. He obviously, obviously had to have gotten stronger. Last time we saw CP9, they were on the run. They were basically a pirate crew. I was real excited to one day see the CP9 pirate ship and crew that had become stronger and maybe turn babyface, join the good side, or at least join the pirate side since the government turned against them or they become somebody that the 
the Straw Hat crew fights once again, but in a different setting. Maybe on the sea in a boat. I don't know. That did not happen. Apparently, somebody came and found Rob Lucci and told him, you need to still be a part of this system. I was very weirded out by the fact that the government was like, well, they failed, so they must be eliminated. Um, like, these guys are very important, and they, they have no qualms against the world government. They want to serve you. They are powerful. Why would you let them go? I mean, they failed because they underestimated their opponents. But if you let them get stronger, like they have with Kaku and um, Rob Lucci, something good's going to happen. There's a dude behind them with a mask on who I could only assume is uh, Bluno. But no, I don't see Bluno. I do not see Caulifla. I do not see uh, the the weird guy. I don't see the uh, Chapapa guy, the zipper mouth. Where are they? Where is the rest of Lucci's gang. I mean, I know they weren't close, but they saved his ass after, if you watch, if you look at the cover uh, pages, the cover stories of Rob Lucci after the Ennis Lobby arc, you see him get saved by Bluno and his door door fruit. Like, where are his boys? Were they murdered by somebody? Were they assassinated by somebody? Uh, did Lucci and Kaku have to kill them so they can get back into the world government? Because if so, whoa. And how evil could this Lucci guy be? I, I, I thought they were maybe turning him, turning him into a good fella. But no, no, he's a, he's a brutal son of a biatch. He is not going babyface. He is becoming more evil. The evilest. Uh, speaking of assassinations, before we get to the conclusion of Shirahoshi being turned into a pet, uh, we get to see Do Flamingo, Dofi. I just finished the Doflamingo, uh, or the Dressa Rosa arc in the anime, and wow, am I a big Doflamingo fan. He has gone up in my book. He is a fantastic villain, and I, I, mean, I really liked him before, but seeing him in, you know, moving and talking, it was, it was great. He's an evil son of a bee, and I am excited to see more of him in the story now that his arc is over. Maybe he's got something else coming he can't be redeemed. I can't imagine him ever getting redeemed after what he did. He was a shit kid, and he was a shit adult. He had a twisted mentality. But he also went through a lot of crap. But he was kind of shitty, and his brother went through the same shit, and he was great. He was a sweetheart. Uh, but seeing him again and mentioning that somebody has sent a assassination, assuming the Celestial Dragons have sent an assassin to kill Doflamingo, or is he assuming they're going to? Because if they have, I would love to know who that assassin is. Who could possibly kill him? I guess anybody could since he's got, you know, sea stone prism uh, handcuffs on him. So what are you going to do, Dofi? How are you going to get out of this one? You've got no more help coming. Will he be assassinated? I don't think so. I don't think Oda would keep him around unless he was going to use him. And I think Doflamingo could either become somewhat of an ally since he does know this information about the celestial dragons that could tear them apart destroy their whole system apparently uh why doesn't he just let that out maybe he knows once he does he's pretty much uh, expendable but at this point he's locked away and he can't tell anybody but somehow he knows that an assassin might be coming I don't understand unless he has somebody working for him that works in the prison. He did look like he was talking to Magellan, but I can't imagine Magellan being bought off by Doflamingo. It's crazy. Oh my god. And then, so Carlos gets stopped by another celestial dragon who happens to be related to Doflamingo. This guy is a familiar face as well. It was the same douchebag that captured Shirahoshi's mom all those years ago, and she saved him. And he has completely changed. I loved that part. I love that he was not even the same character. It just shows how people are different. They can be changed. People can change. They're not always going to be 100% evil or 100% good. And that scene shows that this complete asshole um, celestial dragon that was just a piece of shit who came to take his slaves back. Uh, and he went to Fishman Island to do that and expected them to come with him because he ordered them to. 
This guy was terrible, and he comes in basically an entirely new character, a new person, showing that people can change if they are taught correct, um, you know, taught correctly. And I thought that was really cool. And he got, he actually whacked Carlos uh, across the face, pretty brutal like, and I really enjoyed that. That was a cool scene. It was almost as good as Luffy punching him, but not near. Um, but it was cool to see him again. It was cool that King Neptune, who was going to attack the Celestial Dragon, learned that not all the Celestial Dragons are bad, uh, just like not all fishmen are good. And that's a lesson uh, that he needed to learn. Uh, and I mean, I thought that was really cool. I needed to learn that there was more Celestial Dragons that were good. I knew that uh, Doflamingo's dad was trying to be good. His intentions were good, but it seemed he didn't know how to live in a world of uh, normal folk. <laughs> and he was trying to live a better life for his family. And it just didn't work out. It didn't because of, the, because of the years of hate. And maybe this celestial dragon who has decided not to have uh, slaves, um, which was kind of interesting. He might be the only celestial dragon without slaves has learned his lesson and maybe he instead of leaving the celestial dragons will one day um help them help them from the inside like he just did if he left the celestial dragons he wouldn't have been there to save her he actually probably would have been hung by regular people like his family member was <sighs> after that but we actually don't even get to see the reverie. The whole, all the kings, all these kings and queens show up. They all go sit down. They're going to have a conversation. I can't remember how long it was. I think they said the reverie lasts like seven days. So we didn't even actually get to see what they're going to discuss. I know that Luffy's a hot topic. We also get to see Bonnie, Jewelry Bonnie, in her old lady form sneak in. And she actually sees Charlo or Carlos's dad on top of Bartholomew Kuma, who is now basically a slave for the Celestial Dragons, the in, uh, you know, the indestructible slave. He's all beat up, he's bleeding, he's fat malfunctioning, but he's their, basically their horse now, their human horse. And um, it's pretty brutal and sad because Bartholomew Kuma is a really cool character and I'd like to know more about him, but maybe he really is, like Doflamingo said, dead and he's just a shell. And they've turned him into a machine that can't feel anything. But it turns out he used to be a king of some country as well. Because when they show his name title, it says former king of something. But he's also part of the same kingdom that apparently Bonnie is the queen of. Because when she was in her old form, they... I think they treated her like the queen of something and they told her you can't go in there That's where the celestial dragons live. She runs up sneaks in when uh, when commotion is happening, I believe and uh, Gets in and she starts crying after she she sees Kuma in that state and There's some connection with her and Kuma. How old is Bar uh, uh, Bonnie? I know she can get older and I know she can get younger, but she could literally be a child that's making herself older. So she could be Kuma's daughter or she could be an old lady. She could be Kuma's mom. She, he could be Kuma's wife. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Like, what did Kuma do to deserve this? I want to know. I really do. And if it's a spoiler, don't say it. But if it's not, tell me in the comments. If you know, what did Kuma do to deserve this kind of shit? I know he signed up to be uh, the prototype for the pacifista, but what's going on? Speaking about prototype of pacifistas, we get to see uh, Fujitora talk to the other mystery admiral. Cannot remember that guy's name. He's actually shrouded in darkness. And he tells him that um, Akainu told him to capture him and bring him in. I believe, or no, or kick him out of the reverie because he's not supposed to be on military grounds. And Fujitora is like, well, this is not military grounds, basically, which it isn't. It's not. It's the Celestial Dragon area. Fujitora is here to abolish the Shishibukai system, which is pretty interesting. And what would that mean for people like Hawkeye Mihawk or, or Boa Hancock, people we know are good people? 
good pirates that are still Shishibukai or even Whitebeard's supposed son, Weevil. Like, he just became a Celest or a, a Shishibukai. Like, we haven't even got to see him do anything yet. So they, they can't abolish the warlord system. That would, that would throw the world into chaos. Um, I would say meeting this new admiral, the only impression that I found that he said that he doesn't, he hasn't eaten or something in three years. He's been fasting. He must have eaten a devil fruit where he doesn't need to eat, I guess, which would suck. That sounds like the worst devil fruit ever. Uh, I don't have much of an opinion about him because he's barely shown. He's just a mystery man with no information. Uh, Kainu and um, Kizaru doesn't, they don't do really a whole lot. They do, they think they, they might see Luffy's bounty and they might be mad that Fujitora is over there. I would love to see more Kasaru. I think he's a mysterious man. I'd like to know his backstory, what's going on with him. I feel like he's got some kind of tie with uh, Mr. Uh, Vegapunk, who apparently, according to Fujitora, has invented a new thing to replace the Warlord system. My only assumption would be a perfect, perfect pacifista. Something even stronger, a like crazy roboted out um, Kuma is what I can assume. But if that's true, or maybe just seven Kumas that are just very powerful, uh, that's my only guess. And there's like, these are the new warlords now. These are them. They work for us and they're basically not even pirates now. They're just robot androids. They're basic, they're just robots. They're not even androids, would they be? I don't know. Um, so that's mysterious as well. But the biggest thing to happen, the biggest thing, even bigger than, than uh, Shanks showing up, maybe not, is this mysterious guy named Emu. Is it Emu or Aimu? Um, he shows up, very weird looking, has weird eyes. He looks, they show his one eye and almost looks like the Renegon from the Naruto series. I was like, holy shit, it's pain. Pain is here. Where is the rest of the Akatsuki? But um, he's got the Renegon. I, ho I hope it's not Madara. But uh, his eye is crazy. It almost looks, it almost looks like uh, Hawkeye's, Mihawk's eyes. Um, but he sits in this chair of chairs, this crazy uh, throne, and it's covered in swords and whatnot. And we find out that it, no one sits in this throne anymore because the 20 kings who came and put the world government together uh, decided there should no longer be one king. And now there's just the celestial dragons and the five elders, but not one person. But later in the arc, we see this emu guy and he looks like he's cutting up pictures of Luffy and Blackbeard. And um, he goes and sits in the chair and the five elders walk up and I wonder how strong these elders are by the way they walk up they kneel to this guy like he's their king their leader this thing and they tell him like do we need to like snuff out another light in the world or something some shit like that like what does that mean who are they gonna snuff out are they, do they mean Luffy because obviously you guys have been after Luffy for a while. But why do you need to go up to this king right now? Is it because we're finding out that Big Mom is about to meet up with Kaido and it's really causing some shifts? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think the Celestial Dragons are the uh, five elder Celestial Dragons. These super Celestial Dragons, they do mention something about purging the world because they can't keep the, the balance of power and whatnot together, which is wild. Uh, I hope there isn't a purge night where everybody's just going nuts and murdering. There's not usually a lot of murdering going on in One Piece. So if that did happen, that would be a crazy event. I can't imagine that would actually happen. It depends. How strong is this emu guy? Um, it's thrown another wrench into my theories, this dude, this thing, who also sh reveals a giant straw hat in a room, I think in a, like an ice box, it almost looked like it was frozen. So like a giant straw hat. And I don't know what that means at all in any way, shape or form, but it is mysterious as all heck. Uh, I don't believe he is Shanks because I think right before we met him, Shanks was in the room. Um, it's all a little confusing. Like where did Shanks go? Is he still there? Did he leave? Uh, we get to see Kobe kicking ass, taking names, taking names, 
kicking ass. Uh, he's gotten better at being a, I believe he's a captain now in the Navy. I was almost hoping he'd be a vice admiral, but I assume that takes a very long time to do. But Kobe, being one of the main characters in the Marines, becoming the youngest ever vice admiral would be a hell of a feather on his cap. Honestly, I feel like Kobe could have his own side show where we just follow Kobe's adventures as he's watching Luffy in the newspaper. I think that would be fun. Like after the series is over, I would be so stoked if they just did like a Kobe movie. You ever seen uh, Lion King one and a half where they show the perspective of Puma and Timon? Like I would love that with Kobe and Hell Nepo and Garp on their adventures and uh, him learning how he can use hockey and whatnot and becoming a vice admiral, which I assume is his end goal. There can't be more than three admirals. I, it would be crazy if before the end of the series he becomes an admiral, the youngest ever admiral, or even the fleet admiral because everybody dies and he's the only on their option. <laughs> I can't imagine that he's gotten anywhere near as powerful as Luffy. Have you seen fucking Snake Man? Gear 4, Snake Man, that thing was intense. And I can't imagine that Kobe could go head to head or toe to toe with somebody like Katakuri or even Doflamingo. I would be surprised. Um, there's so many questions. Just when I think I have the answers, Oda changes the questions. And now with this, this emu creature thing, uh, I'm wondering if that was a crown on his head or if that was part of his head. What is going on in One Piece here? Like this was such a short, a short little arc and I've got so many mysteries to unravel. But what I'm excited about is the fact that we get to see Lucci again. We do get mention of uh, another pirate named Rox uh, that happened to roll with Kaido and Big Mom at one point. Uh, Garp mentions this when they're all having a, me a feast with the Marine Sea. Right there, I'm sure I missed plenty more in this arc. I'm going to have to read it multiple times to really soak it all in. Um, I hope they answer some of these questions early on. I hope, well, I know now that Shirahoshi's safe. They won't tease her being captured. I was seriously thinking that she was going to be captured. And when the Tantata tried to come save her, I think it was Leo, and I think Rob Lucci or Kaku grabbed him out of thin air. Those things are fast. Um, I want to see Rob Lucci some more. I was disappointed because I had the hopes. After I saw Lucci, I had these bits of hopes that we'd see a crocodile. I was almost thinking because we got to see Wapple back in power. We got to see other things happening. Uh, we got to see, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy that's now running Drum Kingdom, we got to see him again, and now he's in power, and yet he's not necessarily, you know, related to some king. So I was wondering if maybe Crocodile, Sir Crocodile, was going to show up now, the king of some uh, random kingdom, maybe the, the Taco Kingdom. I'm not sure if you realize there was a King Taco in, in this bunch, which I assume won't be an important character, but you never know with One Piece. Maybe King Taco will be the final enemy in the entire series. I think there was a King Hamburger. Um, I think Oda was just having a good time there, unless there was a translation error. But it would have been interesting if Crocodile had taken over a nation over the last two years, and maybe him and Mr. One had shown up. That would have blown my mind. <laughs> Speaking of Mr. One, Mr. Two has been missing from the story for a very long time. If you don't know, he is alive according to the cover stories, and we did get to see um, Impel Down level 6 with uh, our boy Dofi. It would have been nice to see Bon Clay again. I think it would have been great. It would have made so much sense for Bon Clay to be locked up in uh, level six after what happened. Wouldn't it have been great if for the next, you know, few arcs, we have the interactions of Bon Clay and Doflamingo stuck in a cell together with nobody else at all to talk to. That would be a fun conversation. I would love to hear them have a conversation, them just both bolted to the wall, strapped there, and maybe the assassin shows up and Bon Clay could be helpful in saving Doflamingo or something. I don't know.
It would have been a fun interaction. I would like to see Bon Clay as well. I'm having nostalgia with withdrawals with the uh, Al uh, Alabasta crew, the bon Baroque Works crew, especially after seeing Vivi again. Um, it seems like she's going to play a big role here in the Reverie. I think that Vivi will actually be a bigger part in the Reverie uh, when the conversation actually begins than Rebecca. Then, because Rebecca gave up her queen, her her uh, kingdom, so she shouldn't even be there. Hopefully, Viola does get some screen time at some point. Uh, and I can't imagine that Princess Sharahoshi is going to have anything bigger to do. But I know she's supposed to be this great weapon. Um, so, I guess I'm just walking over my own words. This review is over. That was the Reverie arc. What did you guys think? Uh, please comment down below. Was there any characters like Crocodile, or myself, that you were disappointed weren't in the Reverie? I was really hoping we would see all the players, including Hawkeye Mihawk. We haven't seen that fella in a minute. I would love to have seen Perona as well. Maybe they're saving them for Wano. Uh, we're almost there, people. We are there. I think the literally the next page, the next chapter, is the beginning of the Wano arc. I this Wano thing that I I have been hearing about it since I started watching One Piece uh, over a year ago. So this thing's been going on a long time, and I'm here now. I'm in Wano now. That's so crazy for me. I thought this thing was going to be so big. I didn't know what to think of One Piece, but now that I'm here, look at behind me. Look at all this One Piece figurines and whatnot. I love this series, and I'm so excited to see what happens. And I can't wait to unravel these mysteries, but at the same time, I don't want it to end. This is more Fanime. Please subscribe and tell your friends. Talk to you later.